But I work for a German company called Transolar, and in Germany we don't say climate, we say klima. So that's why we call ourselves klima engineers. And actually the question is, what does a climate engineer do for a living? Depends who you're going to ask. If you ask my friends, they may think I am a clown, and they may be right. Because actually, I just finished a project where a French artist asked me to make flying balloons filled with helium. And I was like, is it a joke? But actually, there was a bunch of science behind it. Uh, my mom, I tried to explain her for the last 10 years, actually, that I'm not chasing tornadoes. I go on site, make measurements, and so on. But as far as I can, I stand far away from tornadoes. I told you that the company I work for is named TransSolar, and of course in this name there is solar. So when I talk to people that have no clue about engineering, they think, ah, okay, so basically you are putting PVs and you are doing something with solar energy. They are 50% right, I would say, because I'm dealing with renewable energies, but not all the time, and that's not the core of my work. The architects I'm working with, they probably think we are crazy. They are probably right, actually. But as long as they like our creativity and our craziness, uh, we keep sustaining a very good collaboration. And sometimes we try to bring them in a trip back to the future. Obviously, after a long day of work, I sit back, relax on my, on my chair, and I think, well, amazing. What I'm doing is really rocket science. No, 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 no. Climate engineering is everything but not rocket science. If we want to somehow slow down global warming and meet the 1.5 degrees bottom line set by the Paris Agreement, we need to reduce all of our CO2 emissions in the next 30 years by the third of what they are today. That's a huge piece of work. And we have to do this uh, by, of course, changing from coal plants or nuclear plants to renewable energies. But considering that the building industry consumes about 40% globally of the energy demand, it means as well that our buildings must be energy efficient. In 1902 was erected the flat iron building in New York. This building was the best example of energy efficiency and smart design. It had openable windows for natural ventilations. Workplaces were located along the facade for a good daylight access. Um, and suddenly, 50 years later, a game changer came in the market, the air conditioning. And that completely split the work between architects and engineers. Architects designed any kind of building they wanted, and then engineers came afterwards, put the air conditioning unit anywhere, and everything was possible. And you can see it in the world. Thanks to the air conditioning, basically, we have all the same architectural design anywhere on the planet. The climate is turning to become not relevant anymore. We have these huge, tight buildings, glazed facade. So we are really facing a global issue. And on top of this, if you, are, if, you, if you design a building which is not comfortable, where the quality of living is definitely not met, then it's just a huge waste of resources. And actually, those tight air envelope buildings, um, if there is a power shortage, there is no more fresh air. So people working there or living there must leave the buildings. So what shall we do? I'm asking you. Shall we cut the power by ourselves? Or shall we let the nature do it for us, as Sandy did it in 2012? Climate engineering is nothing else than bringing high quality of living and energy performance and as well other resources in built environment, whether they are inside or outside. And for this, we have a three steps approach which is first minimizing the resources, meaning looking at what the climate, what the site has to offer to fit as much as needs of the building demands. 
Step two is the energy optimization. The remaining needs are then met with high, uh, high energy efficiency systems. And those systems are fed with renewable energies. That's the last step, the energy substitution. Now I would like to talk with you about the step number one, because that's act actually about 80% of the job. And if you want to perform the, the, the step number one, it means you have to look at the local identity. So let's make a trip around the world all together, and I'm bringing you right now to Mazda City. So we have been uh, involved on the side of Foster and Partner into the development of the Mazda City Master Plan. Actually, we started by massing uh, the, the master plan, and we found out that if the streets are oriented north, south, or east, west, it results in a very high cooling demand, and we don't match with the daylight access. But if we turn the building slightly by 45 degrees, um, in that case, we can balance daylight access um, and, and energy demand. And that's really interesting because that's exactly what the Verna architecture, architecture brought us uh, or taught us a um, couple of, uh, I mean, wait, 2,000 years ago. In Abu Dhabi, there are two prevailing wind directions. The wind directions, the hot winds, are coming from the northwest, they're coming from the sea, and the cold winds are from the southeast, and they're coming from the desert at night or in the early morning. So in the master plan, we had to kind of prevent the hot winds to enter in the, to, to flood the street. So what we did is that we basically aligned the long street perpendicular to the wind direction, while the small street between 10 and 75 meters long maximum could be um, implemented into the wind direction. And by doing so, we can prevent the hot winds to flood the city and they just uh, be, they, are, they are just flushed above the city. So in red, you can see the, the small street in the wind direction, and the maximum uh, length of those streets is 75 meters. But we are facing an issue then, because our master plan prevents the hot winds to enter, um, to enter the, let's say, the streets. But the, the, the winter winds, oh sorry, the cold winds actually, uh, are 180 degrees opposite. So the question is, how can we bring those cold winds to flush the city, to make it cooling down at night uh, in, in order to, let's say, reduce the thermal mass? It was very simple. We had to look what the ancient civilization has done. And we just reinterpreted the sense of the, uh, of the Persian towers, so the wind towers. And so that's the, that's the plot, which is already built in Mazda City. Um, we do have some wind catcher catching at the roof level the cold wind and redirected it into the streets. Uh, we do have as well a big wind catcher, a higher one, that features a system of evaporative cooling, which means that we spread water uh, in this tower and then the hair becomes um, colder, heavier, falls down into a giant plaza and it, fools, uh, it uh, floods with cold air this place. So if you look at uh, the temperature in the city of Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi has been built following the master plan of Manhattan. So in terms of climate, it's definitely not responsive. And in Abu Dhabi, uh, while the air temperature that's right before, before summer is 37 degrees, the mean radiant temperature, so what you actually feel, is 48 degrees, and, uh, and the asphalt is 57 degrees. Now, looking at a canyon street, a typical canyon street in Mazda, the air temperature is two degrees higher than in Abu Dhabi, 39 degrees. But we do have a mean radiant temperature almost 10 Kelvin lower than in Abu Dhabi, 37 degrees. And the ground is 33 degrees. So talking about energy now, if we would have designed Mazda City as a current United Arab Emirates city, Dubai or Abu Dhabi, we would have missed about 50% of area to place PV, uh, which means that basically we could not make a zero energy city. But because we have applied the step one and two, we could lower the energy demand by 80% in comparison to Mazda, to, Dama, uh, sorry, to Abu Dhabi. And then we could only cover the rooftops and a bit of land by 230 hectares to kind of um, 
offset the, ele the global electrical demand of Mazda. Let's go now to a much colder climate. Let's go to Winnipeg. In Winnipeg, the temperature in summer is 30 degrees. In winter, minus 30. So we have 60 Kelvin swings during the year. The winds are constantly south-oriented. And actually, what is really amazing in, uh, in Winnipeg is that in winter, it's extremely cold, but extremely sunny. There are more solar radiation in Winnipeg than in Milan. And that was the key parameters to design this building with KPMB. Actually, in winter time, the, the, the south winds pushes the hair naturally into six uh, flow height atriums that as well collects all the sun energy. So this cold hair is naturally heated up by a greenhouse effect and then distributed into the, um, into the workspaces. Then the air is, of course, extracted. There is a heat recovery system, and the energy of the air is then transferred. In summertime, we actually do the same thing, but the extraction is driven by this chimney. It's exactly like a chimney we can have in our house in cold climate. But it uses the stratification effect of the air by maintaining a certain temperature difference all along this duct to drive a natural airflow and to avoid any kind of mechanical system for air extraction. On top of this, uh, this building is heated and cooled by the random slab system, which is fed with a heat pump and uh, with 200 geothermal boreholes, 200 meters deep each. The building as well has an operable facade for natural ventilation, um, which means that whenever possible, uh, according to the outside climate, then the, 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 the people can open the facade and get access directly to fresh air. That's the atrium, and there are as well the mechanical rooms. That's probably the most beautiful mechanical rooms ever designed. Actually, people use them for yoga or for tea break, but that's in those rooms, in these uh, six floor height rooms, that the solar gains are captured and are used to heat up the fresh air. So when we worked on this, um, on this building, uh, our energy model showed that we would demand a total energy demand of 88 kilowatt hour per square meter and per year. That was our target. And after a two years commissioning, commissioning is an extremely long process if you want to make your building working as expected. So after the two years commissioning, we reached 85 uh, kilowatt hour per square meter and per year, which makes Manitoba Hydro five times more energy efficient than any other high rise building in North America. Now we fly to Syria, to Damascus precisely, where we design a French school with our architect Atelier Lyon. Actually, um, the parents of uh, the pupils being, uh, being in, this, in these schools have to pay for the tuition, but they had as well to pay um, for the construction of the facility, the construction of the school. Um, so we had to keep it extremely low budget. So now if you consider that a mechanical system uh, in any kind of building is about 20% of the budget, if we would rely on zero mechanical system, we would have saved 20% of the price of this school. And this is what we do, actually. Because in Damascus, uh, also in, in summer, the air temperature, the outside air temperature is quite hot. We capture it and it flows uh, below the ground slab of the building, where in contact with the cold ground, this hair is then naturally cooled and then supplied naturally into the classrooms. The, let's say, ersatz to the mechanical system is again a solar chimney that constantly drives the airflow. And we touch the pupils, actually, before they leave the classroom to open the windows at night. And by doing so, the cold uh, night hair enters the room, cools down the concrete, that is a thermal mass, actually, and that makes it able to absorb, later on, uh, the energy gains in the room. During a winter day, that's exactly the same idea than during the summer day, except that the cold air is heated up by the hot ground. 
But local identity is not only talking about the climate, it can be anything. Um, that's what we discovered when we work on the Dolphy Renaissance School uh, in Germany uh, with Sana Architect. Actually, Sejima, the architect, wanted to have a building uh, with a concrete facade, uninsulated, and this concrete facade must be as thin as possible. And that's definitely a no-go. In Germany, you cannot have a, let's say, simple monolithic concrete facade. You need to insulate them. You need to insulate it. And the insulation should be at least 20 centimeters. That means that if you have a 20 centimeters concrete wall and a 20 centimeters um, insulation, then you hand up to a 40 centimeters wall, which was definitely, for Sejima, a no-go. So we kind of kept investigating, and we found out that nearby our school was a mine, an unused mine. 1,200 meters deep, and this mine was subject to water infiltration. So the facility management of the mine that was still operating had to pump every day water at 35 degrees temperature, and they dumped it in the river. Free energy just dumped in the nature. So we met with the facility management system. Uh, we gave them some bread cell, and then they were convinced to help us to gather this heat. Uh, and with this heat, actually, we transferred it into the walls of our building. So we activate the walls, we heated the walls for free, with this free energy, uh, and this is what we call the active insulation. So basically, uh, it kind of offsets the, 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 the simple thermal insulation just by heating those walls and then preventing any energy losses from outside to inside. And this is how we could kind of preserve the very strong architectural narrative of the architect. And this is how we could kind of achieve this um, paper, thin, uh, paper cigarette thin walls. Let's uh, come back to Abu Dhabi now. I would like to speak about the Louvre. Uh, the climate identity of Abu Dhabi except the temperature is that there is a lot of dust and a lot of humidity. So a lot of airborne particles. You probably all know uh, that Jean Nouvel, the architect, um, was inspired by the light filtered through palm leaves to come up with the Louvre. And kind of it becomes uh, what he has called afterwards the rain of light, made not by palm trees for the Louvre, but by a 180 diameter dome uh, with a certain pattern actually that filters the light and that provides one, the rain of light, and two, a certain pattern. Um, on the floor made by the dome cladding. We all have encountered this rain of light effect. Here you can see it in a souk in Marrakesh. Uh, we may think that it appears randomly, but it's not. It needs two factors to be seen by our eyes. The first factor is what we call the Tyndall effect, which means that the air must be full of airborne particles in order to scatter the light. And the second parameter is actually the high light, the high light contrast uh, between the ambient light and the sunlight. When these two parameters are met, this happens. Um, knowing this, we have first started to inform the design of the Louvre with a cardboard plate that we have attached to our, our facade, as we were the responsible of making the rain of light appearing in the Louvre. And actually, what we did here was to inform uh, the cladding of the dome, because it's clear that if you put a carton, uh, if you, let's say, uh, knowing that uh, the sun has some particularities, at a certain distance, the shape or the shade generated by an object will disappear. Here. Um, that's about uh, a 20 centimeter or whatever um, hole, and then you see at 20 meters away from the, uh, from the, from the object, the shade starts to vanish. So our first design advice to Jean was, don't make any opening below one square meter, if not, you will not see that. And this happens actually because the sun rays are not parallel they are slightly divergent by 0.3 degrees. What you might think it's negligible, but actually it's not. Um, we made some first simulations of the shade pattern 
on the, on the floor of the piazza, and without, without any sun divergence, you get a very neat image. But if you consider this 0.3 degrees divergence and the distance between the floor of the museum and the dome, actually, okay, this is what you get, a very blurry image. Um, so the dome is composed by different layers, actually, uh, composing first an inner dome and an outer dome, and together attached to um, a structure. The outer dome, the final design of the outer dome has a perforation rate of 15.3%, and the inner dome 20%, which means that both uh, domes, actually, together, filters about 99.97% of the sun. Um, we kept our process of uh, kind of informing the design of the Louvre with a 1 to 200 um, uh, model. Uh, and we simulated the illuminance below the dome on the, on the piazza uh, by using either an artificial sun, that's a, that's a room that really simulates um, uh, the sky and the sun, this is the sun, it provides uh, 120,000 lux, so exactly the same illuminance that we get from our natural sun. And when the weather could allow it, we went on the roof of our office to um, make real tests with the real sun. If we wanted to maintain a low, a high contrast, so a low luminance level uh, below, the, below the, um, the dome, we had to kind of play with the colors of the floors the walls of the buildings and the roof. And here you see that we were checking what would happen if we cover all the roofs with a black surface. The black being absorptive, uh, it reduced, let's say, the illuminance level below the dome. When we were done with this, um, we, if I can say so, we played with a one-to-one -one scale mock-up that we located uh, where the current Louvre Abu Dhabi stands. So this mock-up is just a very simple steel structure covered with steel plates, but on the top, we have a 10 meter by 10 meter real dome structure um, that we could tilt to simulate different sun position. And I was clear that if in this mock-up, we have a very low contrast, a very high contrast, so very low illuminance level, then the rain of light appears greatly. But if we start to adjust the light level in the mock-up as we expect it in the Louvre Abu Dhabi, in the real Louvre Abu Dhabi, then the rain of light starts to vanish. So for us, it was a sign that we could, the rain of light could really happen, but it demands a very strong regulation of the light level below the dome. That's our client uh, with the architects admiring the rain of light uh, because the mock-up as well was an extraordinary tool of communication. And the client and the architect in a 1 to 33 um, model. They are smiling, actually. They look very happy, uh, but we were not happy. We were not happy because in this, ad in this model, we could not see the rain of light. So we turned the problem upside down and then we figured out that actually the light is scalable but not the dust. What does it mean? It's very simple. It means that in this 1 to 33 model, um, the concentration of airborne particles in Abu Dhabi was not enough to be able to make the rain of light visible for our eyes. So we made a model of our mock-up, 1 to 33 scale. And <clears throat> we kind of blow smoke or blow haze in this model, oops, sorry, in, to, uh, in order to find the perfect, let's say, smoke concentration that would mimic exactly the airborne particle concentration in Abu Dhabi. So basically, this is what we have in the mock-up and with a calibrated smoke concentration, this is what you get. And then we supply in the 1 to 33 model this amount of smoke. And finally, we could see the rain of light. So the Louvre Abu Dhabi opened on the November 11th, 2018. Um, and during that day, uh, it was a beautiful day, the rain of light did not appear, or only sporadically. 
And even if it was an official event, you know, an engineer is constantly bringing tools with him. Uh, so I had my measurement tools, and with my CEO, we took 50 measurements to calculate the light level below the dome and outside the Louvre. And we found out that the light level was perfect. It was exactly like our predictions. But actually, during that day, that was a beautiful day. Low humidity, sky extremely clear, that shows that there was no dust in the air. So basically, there was not enough airborne particles in the air to showcase, to scatter the light, and uh, to make the rain of light visible. But during a foggy day uh, in December, probably because the Louvre wanted to wish us a good year, the Louvre was really into, um, into a high humidity level. And at that day, during that day, finally the, the rain of light appeared and showed us that this is a fragile and uh, uh, unstable piece of art. All this, this knowledge that we have gathered during the Louvre Abu Dhabi process, that was a 10 years process actually, we used it for our installation in the Venice Biennale in 2016 that we have entitled Lightscapes. So here the idea was to reproduce the crepuscular rays, which are actually the sun rays being flickered by, the, by any kind of obstacle. It can be a mountain or in that case, it can be clouds. And actually, if the crepuscular rays looks, um, look not parallel, that's only a perspective effect. If you look from the top, they are almost parallel. Don't forget the 0.3 degrees divergence. So this installation uh, comprises about 20 light spots that we have selected to match perfectly the um, temperature of the sun at noon, the light temperature of the sun at noon, um, and as well this 0.3 degrees divergence. We made this installation in a very old building, which is called the Arsenale. Uh, where it was definitely not difficult, was not a challenge to make this kind of high contrast. Uh, but it was a challenge to make the light visible by the Tyndall effect. So what we have done actually is that we found out that by spreading water in the air, by a water misting, so we are misting water particles, 100, micro, uh, 100 microns diameter water particles to maintain an 80% constant relative uh, humidity level. And thanks to this, we can scatter the light and make it visible to everybody. In 2010, still for the Venice Biennale, um, Tetsuo Kondo and, uh, and Tronsola have worked on a, on, a cloud, on a cloudscape installation. So basically here the idea was how can we showcase to everybody climate engineering and the idea came naturally, okay, we have to make a cloud. Because nothing is uh, as much visible as a cloud. So how did we make a cloud? Actually, um, the cloud is a 25 degree Celsius hair layer saturated with hair, which means that the, uh, saturated with, vapor, uh, with water, sorry. So which means that the water is in the liquid state in suspension in the air. And this cloud relies onto a cooler and drier air, 18 degrees and 40% relative humidity. Now if we would have had only these two layers of hair, then the cloud would touch the ceiling of the, um, of the room and would start to condensate, and in this case it would drain, and the cloud would disappear. So we had, we, we had to add again um, a third hair layer, much hotter, to kind of control the height of the cloud. Um, so the visitors during this installation could uh, walk in a ramp uh, that would give them access to uh, below the cloud, in the cloud, and above the cloud. The cloud has been a quite demanded installation by Transolar. Also, this is not what we are doing um, constantly, I would say. And the last installation was for the jewelry Cartier. Cartier wanted to use a cloud um, to showcase their last fragrance called L'Envol, the takeoff. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the key elements was this cloud had to be a smelly cloud. So basically that's a cloud and you can smell inside the fragrance. 
it has to stay outside. So that's why it's enclosed in a six meter, uh, six by six by six meter glazed box. Um, so that was the rendering made by Cartier. Uh, and I don't want to explain the entire process. It would take more than one hour, but this is our final result. So the visitors actually could enter in this SAS to not disturb the conditions into the, into the box and could walk um, through the cloud, actually, through the spinning stairs. I talked about installation, I talked about buildings, but I want now to talk a bit about outdoor environment. And for this, let's fly to Paris. Uh, we have been involved in the refurbishment of a very important place in Paris called Place de la République um, on the side of TVK Architects. This guy with this funny panda beanie is shooting to the Parisian people on the Place de la République, vous êtes super, which means you are great. Um, and that's strange because the pedestrian on this place, they stop and they start to interact. And we all know that Paris citizens, they don't have time. They are always in a hurry. They are running after their metro. That's a cliche, I'm just kidding. Um, but probably that if there is so, um, so, many, so much interaction, um, the place is probably playing a strong role. Let's go back to the basic now. We all know that the urban social sustainability, which means the number of people outside and the time they spend outside is driven by one parameter called the intensity of outdoor activities. So as an architect, if you want to intensify these outdoor activities and therefore intensify the urban social sustainability, the outdoor spot must be uh, well designed, aesthetic, um, of course functional. It needs to answer a certain demand from the public. But for me, as a climate engineer, my role is to make this place comfortable. And functionality, programmation, aesthetic, comfortable makes it um, kind of gathering the people. And if you reach the maximum of your band social sustainability, in that case, of course, you would have some side, positive side effects, like the improvement of microclimatic conditions. The density of activities is increased. Um, people start to establish a social contact between each other local business are promoted, and finally, there is less energy use and CO2 emissions. So, Place de la République before 2013 was just a giant roundabout. Nobody used it, but it's as well a very strong symbol for Paris, the strike, and that's our national sport in France. I'm French. Um, and actually, yeah, that's a very strong symbol. That's the gathering spot of angry people or claiming for their liberty. Um, so what was important was to give back this place to Parisians, not only during a strike event, but on an everyday basis. And for us, as very simple. First, we informed the design uh, by explaining to the architect that by using a solar selective pavement, we would reduce the heat urban island effect, so which means that the pavement does not absorb the solar rays uh, and does not heat up so much, um, while kind of avoiding any glare issues. So a solar selective pavement coupled with deciduous trees, that trees that they lose their leaf in winter. So in winter, you maximize the solar exposure, and in summer, you provide shade. And the last step was water fountains, water features. Because they provide beauty, but they provide as well evaporative cooling. So creating a microclimate um, around those spots. And thanks to these three steps, now Place de la République has completely changed her face. People stop, um, they mediate, they think, they just enjoy the place. Um, it can be as well, sorry a leisure game for the, for the kids. So it's really a sport used every day for any kind of purposes. Exactly, so that's Place de la République after the refurbishment. 
I told you at the very beginning of this presentation that I was a clone, so I think I owe you an explanation on that. Um, the last installation I've done was um, in May, and I work on uh, an exhibition called My Room is Another Fishbowl in the Gropius Bow in Germany with the French artist Philippe Parreno. Actually, Philippe's idea was to immerse the visitor into a, a museum room with fishes floating. Uh, and those fishes are actually balloons filled with helium. But he wanted to animate those fishes in order to really give them uh, a feeling that they are almost like real animals to increase the immersion feeling of the visitor. So we discuss with him and then we find out that if we generate a vortex in the room, then the fishes or the balloons would start to spin as a goldfish in a fishbowl. Took us about one month uh, to find out that we needed to implement what we have called an air column system. Basically, it's a ventilator blowing air into an air collector that um, then flushes air um, horizontally. And then, if you locate those air columns in the right spot at the right direction, then you can generate a, ve a vector. So this vector, this air vortex, let's say, is definitely not strong. We had to keep it at low speed, but it gives a certain feeling. So that's the room, how it looks like um, after the installation, actually. And I was doing, can we play it? Okay, so the movie doesn't work. All right. Um, Okay, so basically, now you have seen what is a climate engineer doing. You can um, make up your mind, uh, but please remind me was about this 1.5 degrees of the of, uh, to kind of slow down the global warming. Okay, so engineers, architect, we need to come back to energy efficiency, and we need to build buildings that are climate responsive. Thank you. <laughs>